What is the worst pain or suffering that you've had? What is the suffering that Jesus had? And how is this portrayed over here? Isaiah 53 talks there about my, uh, how he or, uh, grew up uh, like a tender green shoot, which is a reference, of course, to Isaiah 11 verse 1, where it talks about a root from the ground, dry ground there, a green shoot like a root in the dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. The word there, uh, majestic, can also be translated as he had no beauty or adornment. Now, how many of you ladies here, don't put up your hand, forgot to put any makeup on before you came? Good, Martha. You don't need it. You are beautiful enough. God made you beautiful. Do you know what? Ve many of you ladies wouldn't dare leave the house, right? Like my wife would. Never dare leave the house without just putting a little bit of something and uh, taking care of your appearance in a little way, making sure you're looking good. This is what this word means. It's he, there was nothing beautiful. There was no adornment majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. The concept there is nothing that was flamboyant, that stood out and would attract you. He wasn't that handsome Hollywood star everyone goes crazy over and they Teenage girls shout their lungs out. Oh, you know, I remember the Beatle days. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> there's, there's nothing here that is so attractive that it just draws the attention. He was despised and rejected. Now, I, I'm, I'm wondering why he was not attracted. Do you think that Jesus wanted to attract, have people attracted to his physical appearance? No. What do you think he wanted them to be attracted to? What he said. His words. This is the word of God. He says, I am speaking to you the uh, uh, words of life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wanted them to hear truth as it was in him, not on his exterior. And so Scripture clearly indicates that he wasn't that beautiful, handsome specimen that Adolf Hitler wanted to, you know, perfect the uber-human race, you know, that, 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 that uh, special person. No, not that. He was despised and rejected or abandoned. When you look at John 1 verse 10, what does it tell you there in John chapter 1 and there verse 10? Let's have a quick look there and we'll go back after that to uh, Isaiah 53. John 1, <clears throat> this is such a striking scripture that says he came to the very world he created. But the world didn't what? Recognize him. They didn't know him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Now, is there anyone here that can associate with that? Have you ever been away from home and then gone back to your own family? Thank you, Martha. That must have been horrible. If you went back to your own family, and your own family rejected you. Your own family didn't like you. Your own family turned their back on you and said, we don't know you, we have disowned you. I know of people that have become Christians or Seventh-day Adventist Christians and the parents have turned their back on them and said, we disown you, we don't want to know you. We've heard of stories in the Muslim world that, where that's happened in different faith groups. If you become a Christian in some stricter Muslim faith, then you are shunned. We know about that in some Christian faiths, more fundamentalistic Christian faiths, where you would be shunned if uh, you left the faith. So this is what happened to Jesus. He comes to this world, his own people, and he feels totally abandoned. Now, let's go on. Isaiah 53, and there in verse um, 3, he was despised and rejected or abandoned, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief or with suffering. The word there refers to sickness or illness in the Hebrew. He was acquainted with illness. He knew what it meant to suffer. 
He turned, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. We hid our faces, is what the Hebrew says. So we turned our backs by hiding our faces. He was despised and we did not care. You know, there's few uh, expressions that hit so deeply as this word care. We don't, you don't care. If you don't care, someone doesn't care about you and they say, I don't care about you. How does that make you feel? It's like, wow, if you don't care, I don't feel safe to be with you. If you don't care, I don't want to be near you when something happens to me. If I get a heart attack and you don't care, you're not even going to, you're going to walk away. Caring is a beautiful attraction. And here we see Jesus in a situation where he says, the people that he came to save did not even care about him. Yet, verse 4, it was our weaknesses, uh, once again, the same word used over there as was used in verse 3, in his deepest grief, acquainted with the deepest grief, same word, weaknesses or sicknesses. He carried those sicknesses. Or weaknesses. It was our sorrows or our pain or our disease that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. Or the original uh, talks about being struck. He was stricken or disciplined from God. A punishment for his own sins. And then he describes that in verse 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, and beaten and whooped. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whooped so we could, we, we could be healed. And so here it describes this punishment. Was God punishing his son? Really? Why was he allowing this then? Seems to say that here in Scripture. Seems to say that it was like God crushed him. God did this. And what does 2 Corinthians 5.21 tell us about our sin, about him? He who knew no sin did what? Became sin. So was God punishing him? Yes, because he became you. He became me. And I'm a sinner, and I deserve death and punishment, right? Absolutely. We, we mustn't minimize the fact that here's a transaction where Jesus takes my guilt and gives me his innocence and freedom. And so Jesus gets the punishment that I deserve, is what I read Scripture saying. He was pierced for our rebellion, our transgression, crushed for our sins, our iniquity. He was wounded or pierced. He was beaten, chastised, punished, beaten, so that we would be made whole. The Hebrew word is shalom. So that we would be made whole, so that we would be healed, so that we would have peace. He was whipped. His stripes, beatings, bruised, Wounded, all of those have, is, is what that word means in the Hebrew there. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. And by the way, the, the, the meaning here is not separating the sheep and the goats. He's just saying a farm animal like a sheep or a goat is what the Hebrew word means. All of us, like sheep or goats, have strayed away. Even like old Paco the donkey, you know, if he had to escape or get away... Those of you that have had farm animals, you know what I'm talking about. The time comes where one of those animals decides, I don't want to be here. I'm going to find greener grass on the other side of the fence. How many times as a young herder boy in Africa did I have to go and hunt for my dad's cows or my dad's this and my dad's that? Uh, it taught me an experience that animals sometimes are just as stubborn as we are. They want to run away. They want to hide. They want to find better pastures. And so we have to, God has to come and reel us in, get us back. Like sheep, we have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own way. Yet the Lord laid on him, let fall on him, what? The sins of all of us. Our sins 
was on him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, that is why he became sin and was punished for you and for me. Then in verse 7, he was oppressed. He was oppressed in the sense of a slave. He was forced to work. He was oppressed and treated harshly. The original word there talks about he was humiliated or wretched. He was afflicted. He, the word cringe comes into that word when he was treated harshly. When someone is treated harshly and you see that person just kind of cringe. You know what I'm thinking. You know that feeling is just so vivid in my mind. He was treat, oppressed and treated harshly, yet in all of that he did not open his mouth. He did not say a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep, silent before the shearers, didn't open his mouth, unjustly condemned. Just yesterday, some of you may have picked it up, I think it was yesterday morning, I was listening to a show, I think it was Megyn Kelly or somebody uh, on NBC, and she was interviewing a man by the name of Anthony Ray Hinton. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Anthony Ray Hinton. She asked him, how many years were you on death row? Three zero in Alabama. 30 years on death row. Convicted for murder. And 2015, the conviction was overturned. He was an innocent man that was put on death row to die. And he lived through the torture and the suffering of that, knowing he was on death row for 30 years. Before science caught up, and some de he was eventually allowed to use a scientist that knew his stuff, and they could go and do a decent test, and they found out that the, what he was accused of and convicted uh, of had no merit Stuff in this world happens that is unjust, right? What is this saying? Unjustly, Jesus was condemned and he was led away. How does it feel to know you're innocent and you are unjustly being punished? Just an amazing thing, an amazing thing. Uh -uh. Wow. No one cared that he died without descendant. In other words... Um, the word there, cared, is, is also has the word, concept of lamented or spoke enthusiastically. Loudly, the Jews often loudly lamented. He had no loud laments. He had no, someone speaking up enthusiastically for him. No one cared that he died without descendants. He didn't have a son to follow him up or even a daughter that his life was cut short in midstream and he was struck down for the rebellion of his people. Are you, by the way, a son or a daughter? I'm so glad. Because it says a little later in verse 10, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will have many daughters and many sons through his death. What an amazing, amazing turnaround. Just like it was for this young black man, now an older black man, exonerated from what he was accused of. There's a turnaround for Jesus Christ as well. And Philippians 2 tells us that, doesn't it? It says that he who became man, died, was humiliated. But the time will come when he will come back and every knee will bow before him and say, yes, this is our Lord. We have waited for him. And he will be crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what do these passages teach us? What have they been telling us? Let's see if we can find out what uh, suffering, what do we learn about suffering from these? So when we look at the concept of suffering, there are basically two types of suffering. There's a suffering that uh, is physical, and that's when you have s get sick, that's when you um, hurt yourself, that's what Jerry had, cut himself in his hand. When you get cancer, it's suffering. 
When you get older, it's physical very much, yeah. But there's also the mental, emotional, spiritual type suffering, which is often a very different kind than just, uh, sure, you, you seldom just physically uh, have suffering because it leads to the other as well. But the one is focused on the physical, the other one is a little different. Let's see if we can find out what these two are like. The one deals with my body or my possessions. I suffer when I lose my possessions. There's a flood that happens. And we also notice very often that when we have our testimony meetings at our Vespers, our Vesper test, testimony Vesper meetings, that some of the testimonies are about my illness and how God came in and helped me out of that. And we praise God for that. And it's amazing. We love God for that. But there's also the kind of suffering that is not physical. It's more to deal with mental, emotional stuff that deals with my identity. Yeah, it deals with my identity. And identity has to do with something that's even deeper sometimes than the physical, the hurt. The hurt and the pain and the suffering in the identity. Now, let me use an example of the difference between these two. The body, possessions, you know you have cancer or something else. When a person suffers in your identity, it's something like the testimony we heard last Sabbath afternoon, uh, evening. How many of you were there when Barbara shared a testimony? And I'm using this just as an illustration. Barbara chose not to speak about her physical heart attack and things like that and stroke and so forth. She chose to speak about when she was a child and grew up with dyslexia and no one knew it. She didn't know it, others didn't know it. And how that she was shunned and how she had to always prove herself. That's identity. Is that suffering? You bet it's suffering. But it has to do with who I am. Because if people then say, because you're dyslexic, man, you can't do this. You must be stupid. You must be dumb. There's always this need to prove yourself. And thank you, by the way, Barbara, for sharing from your heart. That was a powerful testimony. But I'm using just to illustrate the difference of suffering. So, which is suffering? One is suffering, the other is suffering. Two types of suffering. Now, when you have illness, is there physical suffering? Is there, when you have an accident, a car accident, is there physical suffering? Or like Jerry had with his hand, it was an accident? Yes, there is. So, we'll mark those. They fall under the physical suffering column. Now, when you look at another aspect, like, for instance, Auschwitz, people in Auschwitz, what kind of suffering did those people have? They had physical suffering? Yes. They were even put in gas chambers and killed. Did they have emotional, spiritual suffering? Ah, because here you now have an identity thing. What was the identity of the people that suffered their main, uh, the main identity? We are Jews. That hits at, at your identity. And when people hurt you in your identity, it causes real suffering. Okay? What about the cross? Jesus suffered physically, yes? Yes. What about his identity? Whoa. Identity is often revealed through relationships. How do you know who you are? How do you know that you're important? Where does self-esteem come from? The smart people tell us, I feel self-esteem or I feel confident in myself because I got it from my parents. My mom and my dad said, you're a special little girl, you're a special little boy, I'm proud of you, you can do math, I know you can, and you'll grow up and become a, uh, an important scientist or a preacher for God. And so there's all kinds of positive things that parents, in the relationship that they have with their children, give them. But if they don't, and they say, man, I don't think you can do math. I don't, think you're, I don't even think you should go to university. I don't think you'll make it. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't. What does that do to that kid's identity and confidence? It goes down the drain. Thank you, mother. But I'm no good. That is suffering, relational suffering. Did Jesus have relational suffering? 
where his father, as we, yeah, the day became dark, nature even turned off the lights, as it were, on the cross. And he cried out, my God, my God, my father, why have you forsaken me? It was like the father could not keep looking at sin, because when he looked at his son, he saw your sin and my sin, and he turned his face from that. We call that justice, and justice was satisfied at the cross because Jesus suffered because of that. But what about the relationship that his dad had that says, this is my beloved son? Did God stop loving his son? No, absolutely not. And there was a resurrection morning, and there was a reunion when Jesus said to Mary, I haven't, don't, don't hold me here, don't keep me down on this earth, I haven't gone back to my father yet, I need to go back to him. There's a relationship. He needs to give me that sense of acceptance of the sacrifice I have given. And so that I know that Jerry will be with me in the kingdom. That Chuck will be with me in the kingdom. That Glenn will be with me in the kingdom. That is why. And so, yes, it was physical suffering, but it was also relational or mental, emotional, spiritual suffering at the cross. So what is suffering? Suffering is something that is deeper. And as I read this in Isaiah 53, I find that both those kind types of suffering, Jesus suffered for you and for me. I want to ask the question, what is the effect that this has on you? Dear God, as we now go to wash each other's feet, it's all about a relationship with you and with those around us. Thank you for suffering. Thank you for the gift of the cross and the suffering that brought peace in our relationship with each other between God, my Father, and myself and also gave and created the possibility of peace between myself and my fellow brothers and sisters, and even to love my enemies. God, send us out into this world to touch the lives of others or allow you to touch people's lives through us, that we may have and share healing relationships that will build and heal and bring peace in this world of strife, in Jesus' name, amen.